Hello everyone, welcome. I thought I would share with you today, I'm going to continue with the retreat and so on in, in other videos, but I thought I would uh, do something a little different and I'm going to share with you an interview that was done by a French uh, channel, an interview with uh, Piotr Tolstoy who is the vice president or the deputy of the Duma, the uh, lower house of the uh, Russian parliament. Uh, this was, um, it says there that uh, this happened about 12 days ago. I have a feeling that perhaps it's a little bit older than that. But um, I, I watched this interview because uh, Piotr Tolstoy, my, my initial reaction was Tolstoy, is that a uh, relation to the great Russian author? Well, yes. Um, he is his uh, great grandson. He was a journalist and a television um, commentator. He was that for a long time, and now he is the the deputy, uh, the, the the vice president of the uh, of the lower house of the parliament. And um, he's uh, you will see he's going to talk about the. the Russia and the conflict and so on. He's not going to say anything new in a way. You know, you would expect, uh, you, you know what he's going to say. He's going to uh, put forward uh, Russia's um, um, point of view and so on. Nothing, nothing new there, but um, there are, it's, 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 uh, sometimes he will insert in his answers some things that I think can make you think the way he says things sometimes. And also because um, I find it uh, fascinating in a way that um, uh, in other countries, in Europe, in France certainly, they seem to be able to interview these people, important people, the politicians there, and they seem to be um, free to interview them. I have seen quite a few interviews with Russian politicians and uh, here in England we don't seem to see them uh, at all or as often. Uh, I don't think in America they, they are able to see uh, these interviews either. But uh, in some European countries it, it looks as if they are free to do so. And so, you know, even though he's not going to say anything that will alarm you <laughs> or anything that, uh, nothing, nothing really new, I thought it was important for me to share it with you. Especially the way I, I thought that this would be a good idea is because, you see, in the last Davos meeting, much was made of the what they refer to as the um, the dangers of uh, disinformation and misinformation and malinformation, <laughs> all this prefix um, of the alternative media, to the point where um, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, actually said that this was uh, the greatest danger at the moment, even more so than climate change deniers and all that, that is, has been put into, you know, to the, to the back burner as it were, and now it's going to be this fight against um, alternative media, social media, I suppose. And um, with the, all the elections uh, this year, 2024, in the UK, in the United States, but many other countries too, India, Pakistan, uh, Egypt, um, um, this emphasis on what they call, for them, is um, disinformation or misinformation. I thought, okay, so what is the difference between disinformation and misinformation and do they apply to malinformation? I don't think so. But anyway, yeah, uh, this, this, if you think about it, okay, this, okay, 
So that is the opposite. Okay, so connect, disconnect, the opposite of an action. Okay, miss is misbehave, misspell. It's, 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 it's doing the opposite, but doing it wrongly. Malinformation, I have, I had to look it up and I see that uh, it is the same as miss, the prefix miss, but, but uh, it's for words uh, perhaps from a Latin or a, uh, a French uh, origin, malcontent, maladjusted, but it's kind of more or less the same. So, the, 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 this information and misinformation this information is saying the opposite of the official narrative i suppose that's another word narrative we are all talking about narrative i'm so tired of these overused words it's like the elephant in the room <laughs> I'm getting tired of can we can we use different vocabulary anyway so that is saying the opposite and miss of the official narrative and misinformation I suppose they mean that you are saying the opposite of the official narrative but wrongly in with the intention I suppose of doing so anyway so with this emphasis on uh, this this um, uh, news media and uh, the uh, the the emphasis on perhaps um, you know the dangers as they said of the alternative media to see something on other uh, other television channels abroad actually interviewing these politicians I I, I thought it would be interesting so they, they they ask him first about the year 2023 and uh, if you could give a summary of the uh, major events and uh, the, the 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 major tendencies for the for this year for the year 2024 and um let's see what does he say um Yes, yeah, had to had to uh, find my notes here. So, on globalization, um, he says globalization is coming to an end. The idea of a unipolar world led by the U.S. and the West is over, and therefore we see the development of a multipolar world with respect to the histories, the ways of living of dif different countries like India, China with the population and with uh, an enormous growth on the population. Uh, the changes and the place of the US and the place of the European Union in the world. The translation may not be tidied up, but anyway, you follow me. I believe, he says, we are entering the er era when no one can give lessons to anyone. Um, it is just not worth it. So the interviewer asks him, so that means we are leaving the hegemon, the American hegemony, but that we are not moving towards another kind of hegemony? No, he says, I, I believe, I hope. That the competition of ideas, the competition within democracies, the competition of lifestyles, if you want, different civilizations, we see it very clearly today. It is not so much countries that are important, it is really the civilizations and the cultures that are important. Each country with its own way of doing things. The civilization of the Near East, of the US, of the European Union, of Russia and China. The citizens of this very complicated geopolitical landscape. But it is starting to take shape in a completely different way from what has been happening in the last 30 years. Uh, 
the interviewer says, I'd like to focus a little about the uh, on the conflict in the Ukraine. In January 2023, on the French channel BFM TV, you said that this is very early on, in January 2023, um, you said that if NATO sent tanks, you were going to burn them. Do you remember that? He says, yes, yes. And then in the interview, they put a clip of this in previous interview. And in that clip, he was talking to a French colonel, this Pyotr Tolstoy. And he's saying to him, uh, Colonel, sir, we are going to burn them, the tanks. So you know that very well. Besides from history, uh, you know that German tanks have been burned on the territory of Ukraine. And we are going to do it again. They show this little clip. And then the question, uh, then you consider that the mission has been, the interviewer is asking him, so then, after seeing that clip, you consider that that mission has been accomplished, and if so, where did you get this certainty from? Well, listen, he says, we see that the mission has been accomplished. I said all that at the start of the famous Ukraine counteroffensive, which many Europeans hoped that Russia would be crushed, going to change the whole situation in the Ukraine with this offensive. In my opinion, ultimately, it is a historic disaster for Europe to have put so much money, so many weapons in the Ukraine without any results. That offensive failed, and therefore we see that the tanks, not only the French tanks, but also the American tanks, and, oh, our beloved British, <laughs> all the military equipment that Europe has provided uh, to the Ukraine uh, were burned around the front line, were burned by the Russians. Um, I think that uh, he, when he says our beloved British, um, there is this, um, what is it, loathing, I suppose. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you, you might be more aware of this than I am, but I, I never felt that the Russians hate the British or that Russia hates England as such. Perhaps I'm wrong. But I do see that the, the British um, government has this thing about Russia. I think, I think it comes from the uh, Crimean War of uh, 1853, or perhaps even earlier. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, so the interviewer says, so you have this certainty and you also had the certainty that Russia was going to win the war. Where did this certainty come from? He says, because Russia, we are in this war. First thing, because our history shows us that every time that the co collective Europe, he says, starts a war against Russia, the time of Napoleon or during World War II, Russia ended this war. And it ended this war either in Paris or in Berlin. So, so in Kiev, it's closer. And we are going to win this war. And my view is that Europe has gone too far in this kind of collective Russophobia. Now, it will have to come back little by little, but it will take time. So now we'll have a decade of cold relations between Europe and Russia in the, in the future. This victory, therefore, says the interviewer, that you announce, do you think it could take place in 2024? I don't know. War is complicated. It is, I am not a military man, but I know that I actually see the state of our society, uh, the way we see it in our society here in Russia. 
the Russians, um, we talk about our culture, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, um, the, if you read them, you will see that the Russian, he doesn't like to be pressured. So the pressure we have suffered over the last 30 years with all this European neocolonialist rhetoric on human rights, on the priorities of the rule of law, all these lessons, all that we see today. The, now today we see the hypocrisy of the West given by the events in Gaza with the Israeli bombings. So fortunately, we didn't believe at the time, and we never believe in things which today the European leaders continue to repeat. Um, wanted to win the war on the, uh, on the battlefield. Borrell said clearly the uh, European Union, um, I suppose, ex uh, external affairs, I suppose. I don't know his title exactly. Uh, Borrell said clearly, there is no need for negotiations. We must win the war on the battlefield. So we will see where the battlefield will end. At the Polish border? Where? You said the Polish border? It could be, actually, I don't know, but it is a fatal mistake for the EU and it is a fatal mistake for Europe to join the US in this anti-Russian rhetoric during the conflict in the Ukraine. Question. NATO is a military organization which has a political function. So according to you, could the defeat of NATO have political consequences, particularly on the American relation, American relationship to Europe? And so, you know, at the beginning, when Russia again called the US and NATO in general for negotiations, it was a question of pushing back the military bases of NATO at the level of 1991. So this call was ignored by the US and the EU. Um, they thought that Russia was a small regional country and therefore that it has no influence on this issue. I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether they think it's, it's just a little regional country with no influence and so on. I, I think they I think they certainly look down on Russia as um, not quite up to par, but of course Russia has all these uh, natural resources. Anyway, NATO will expand because countries want the... Uh, they, what they told us was that NATO had to expand because countries want NATO's protections, protection. For us Russians, what does that mean, do you think? It's very simple to explain it, in my opinion, but somehow no one wants to see it. It means that if there are, for example, NATO missiles on the Ukrainian territory, we have three to four minutes from the moment the missile is launched until our response. If the missiles are in Germany, for example, we have 10 minutes. So for us, it is a question of national security. That's what the West has not understood. And we are going to ensure that our geopolitical national security, we are going to uh, ensure by all means that we have uh, that security, notably also the military, the, by military means, but also by diplomatic means. We will wait until the situation changes. Don't know what, quite what he means by that. Question 2023 was an important year for the BRICS. So let's take a different topic now, leaving the European continent. How do you see this evolution with the entry of new members? in 2024. 
Look, after the start of the crisis in the Ukraine, the US and the EU, he doesn't talk about the collective West. He always, throughout the interview, and it's quite long, I'm just going to deal with a quarter of it, but he always says the US and the European Union. Uh, anyway, um, after the start of the crisis, the US and the EU set out to isolate Russia. Today, two-thirds or three-quarters of the world population are with Russia in the BRICS. It is not, the BRICS is not a military alliance, it is an economic one. Uh, exchanges especially, um, the, the exchanges are especially economic, but with India, China, Egypt now, it's, um, it, it, it will become larger. With this enlargement, we see that two-thirds of the world power in finance, in the economy, are coming together. With this begins a new alliance to work together, even without dollars, using national currencies. The interviewer asks, you talk about China, we, the detractors in particular of Russia, say that the alliance between China and Russia is unbalanced to the extent that China is more powerful industrially. What do you answer to these people? We are very different to the Chinese. They are more powerful industrially, but Russia has its own history and its own brutality, he says, if you want, on the international scene. I don't know the, whether the brutality meant to say it, but that is what he says. So the Chinese respect that. I suppose it could mean power, I don't know. We respect all the historical, political and economic nuances of China. But that said, Russia has never been and will never be a little partner. We have the impression, asks the interviewer, when we look at the relationship between Xi and Putin, that is something special between these two heads of state, but they are, they are of the same generation. And in my opinion, says the interviewer, both appreciate the same things. When we speak of international politics, this is important. Um, and he answers, um, unlike Macron, Scholz, and the British leader who li the British leadership, who changes with impressive speed, uh, leaders leaders like the Russian and Chinese leaders they know that first they have time ahead of them, and they keep agreements, they keep their word. That is important today. You're sure of your partner, even if these partners are, uh, some of these partners are a little emotional from time to time. And it comes out, for example, with Mr. Erdogan, the Turkish leaders. But the, es the essential thing is the personal contacts. They are precisely, it, it is precisely this understanding, this chemistry between world leaders. The interviewer asks, you're referring to, when you say about keeping their word, are you referring to the Minsk agreements, which have not been respected by France and Germany? You say that you actually appreciate that a partner is either, and he cuts him off, in fact, France and Germany, uh, the French leader, Hollande, and the German leader, former G uh, German leader, Angela Merkel, they have recognized themselves today that the Minsk agreements were the means to save Ukraine from the inevitable military defeat in the Donbass and to help Ukraine to slightly strengthening its military infrastructure 
with Western aid. For that, it is an approach which we can't really agree with. When you lie to my face, and let us not forget that the French, like the Poles, like the Germans, have been guarantors for Ukrainian President Yanukovych at the time of the Maidan, the coup d'etat of 2014. So we see clearly, we know the value of European leaders' words now. They don't mean anything because that in uh, sovereignty, that independence is, their independence is relative. They have to call Washington all the time to ask, can we do this, can we do that? Unfortunately, we see that today the European Re Union reminds me of us in the 80s. It is a very complicated organization. Uh, which is in the process of going in all directions at the same time. Uh, the position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hungary, with all the discussions of the 12th package of sanctions against Russia. You know that today, today, there are 17,000 French sanctions against us. And so, throughout the world, we cannot imagine the extent of the pressure being put on the Russian economy, that had been put in the Russian economy, and on us Russians too, personally sometimes, uh, those who live in France or live elsewhere, their bank accounts blocked, all the things are... Uh, all these things are some kind of an epidemic. I hope that sooner or later we'll heal. But it must be noted that the sovereignty and the possibility of making its own decisions for the EU is no longer true. So, what are you hoping for? How could Moscow trust Paris again? I don't know. With new leaders, the end of the unipolar world, the end of uh, Washington dictatorship on Brussels, but I do not see it. Uh, I, I do not see that being the case in the next ten years. Can we move on to Africa? Um, the success of the Russians African summit. Bernard Lugan spoke. Uh, he was surprised by the warmth between the heads of state Putin and Ibrahim Traore, the president of Burkina Faso. It struck everyone. What do you think of this relationship, this return of Russia to Africa? You say it is a return. Well, the African leaders and in general the African peoples they still have the memory of the aid the Soviet Union provided to them during the Cold War when there were the, the two camps, the capitalist and the socialist, the socialist camps. Um, they remember that the, the, the USSR helped them build a lot of schools, hospitals on the continent and so on. Quite a few other things too besides schools and hospitals. but. But that memory, he says, it's still there. And there is something else, in my opinion, that we do not export. Uh, we, do not, we do not actually export the rhetoric on human rights, on the priorities uh, of the West, but rather we discuss with them the economic situation. It, we discuss more practical economic problems. There is no management of their ideas. There is respect for their, their own way of doing things. We don't think that they need lessons from us or from anyone else. So Russia for them is a partner with a long history, but also with the respect today, they respect today, which can open up things of interest to Africans. For example, we had a parliamentary summit also with African parliamentarians. 
they were interested very much in everything to do with digital development, artificial intelligence, and so on. Okay, that is uh, just a little part of the of that interview. Um, I thought it was rather amazing to see the great grandson of Tolstoy there talking. Um, I'm going to put below, um, you know about Gonzalo Lira, this Chilean American um, commentator, uh, YouTube commentator. He did, uh, previous to that, he did, uh, made films and wrote books, and um, but since the beginning of the war, he was kind of more or less stuck in, in Ukraine. I don't think he would agree with being stuck, it was voluntary, but he had two, I don't know whether he was married or divorced, but he had two children there, and it was quite difficult, apparently, to bring them out, and so on, so he decided to stay anyway, and you know that uh, he has, uh, he was arrested, and uh, he died in prison. I used to follow him for quite a while, and um, I don't know why I wasn't looking for his old um, posts or anything. I, I imagined that they had been taken down, I suppose. But it, one of them came up in my feed, and I listened to it because this was about a year ago. So it's quite a long time ago. And um, he is... Um, uh, giving us a, a summary of the whole thing, of the whole war, how it started, how it was going, this, and talks about Washington and the politicians there and so on. And the, the, the um, I thought it was interesting because I remember him at one time. He was he was arrested twice. Okay, and. After he was arrested, and he was arrested that first time for about five days, and then they let him go and they gave him his pass passport and so on. Um, one of the f uh, early, very early uh, videos um, was, was this one, I think. And he says that the cause, he believed that the cause of his arrest was probably this particular video. And this is the video when uh, he, he explains when he talked about this and that and, and I think this was the video that he was referring to, the one that I saw coming up in my feed. And it's a very long one. It's, it, it goes so uh, it goes on for well over an hour. But since it is still there, and I suppose it's still okay to see it. <laughs> I don't know there's this information. But anyway, it's there, so I'm going to put it um, under in the description so that you might, if you want to see it. It's, um, it's interesting. Okay, I'll leave it like that for today. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.